Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Park Place Community Church, and we want to thank you for watching this teaching video. We hope that it's a blessing and a help to you. God bless you. So um, this morning we're continuing our series called I Believe. And one of the things that I love about this series is that hopefully this series has made it more apparent what we are all about here at Park Place Community Church. And that is we are all about following Jesus. That's what we're about. We say it in a lot of fancy different ways. Our mission statement is that we're continually inviting people to take one step closer to Jesus. But when you boil it all down, what we are all about is following Jesus, not just getting knowledge about Jesus. Our purpose here is not to just fill our heads with all this knowledge of Jesus. We're, our desire is actually knowing him, actually knowing Jesus, knowing him so that we can follow him more effectively, so that we can pattern our lives after him. And this process, again, it's something that we, you know, as Christians, we like to make things super complicated, but really just boil down. That's a process that we call discipleship. All of us gathering together, learning about Jesus so we can, you know, follow him, follow the things that he says to us. That really is the essence of discipleship. And the result of that is so that we can align our lives with him. So that we can start to, to pattern our lives or align our lives after Jesus. And I call that coming into divine alignment with God. That our lives begin to align with the things that Jesus has said to us. Everything that God said to us, we start aligning our lives with that. So that our daily lives reflect who Jesus is. How many of you think that's important? That, that our daily lives, the way we live our lives, the people look at us and can see Jesus in the way that we live our lives. And we've been seeing this going through the book of 1 Peter, just a small book. Um, we've been at it for eight weeks now, and we've made it through four verses. <laughs> So how many of you think this series is probably going to extend for a little bit? But, but we've seen in this, in the beginning, we saw what Peter called the people that he was writing to. And, and he's writing to this group, and this group includes us, and he calls this group foreigners. He says that he's writing to foreigners because they were living like Jesus in a world, come on somebody, that's not living for Jesus. Does anybody feel that? That sometimes our lives we're living for Jesus, but it seems like everybody around us is not? Kind of like we're living on the island of misfit toys. Come on, any Rudolph fans? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer fans, come on. The island of misfit toys where there's just all these bizarre toys that that didn't fit in anywhere else. Does anybody feel that sometimes in this world? Like we're living on that island of misfit toys. Like maybe you're a Charlie in the box in a world of Jack in the box, right? So do we ever feel that, that we're that like, we just don't fit in. So Peter tells us, of course you don't fit in because this is not your home. Our home is in heaven. So we're, we're in the world. The Bible tells us that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We don't fit in because we're different. And God uses us as we live for him to affect the world around us. Any changes that God is going to make in this world, he's going to do it through you and me, the church. He's going to do it through us. 
to affect the world. And that really is the church, right? Just what we just said this morning, that we're, we're committing our lives to live for him. We're learning all the things. That's discipleship. And as we come together and do that as a group, you letting God use us to affect the world. That is the church. That's what the church does. So last week we got to verse 4 in 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to refresh our memory though um, from verse 3. It talks about this hope that we have. And there's so much in this verse. If you're a version user, I, I would just, you know, highlight this verse and, and pick the highlight color, yellow or orange or green. I would highlight this verse because there's so much that is included in this. First Peter chapter one, verse three says this, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, exclamation point. So Peter is, is telling us these things and then he kind of gets off on this, you know, excitement. He gets so excited. He said, blessed be the God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of his introduction in the letter. And there was this guy actually, a previous church that I was a pastor at, there was this one guy that when something in the message or in the service really hit him or he saw something he'd never seen before, he would say in this really deep voice, good God, <laughs> good God. I used to count how many good gods we got to how good my message was. But sometimes we get hit with this, you know, like, like, so we see something in God that we've never seen before. We get so excited. Good God. I think that's what Peter was doing here. He was just like thinking about all these things he was just saying. He just got so excited. He had to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, according to his great mercy he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead so who caused us God caused us God caused us to be born again and here's the thing God did it you had nothing to do with it God caused you to be born again. God did it all. We didn't add anything to it. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't do. Sometimes we like to think of salvation as this pie. And yeah, God did most of it. But there's this little slice that we did. No, we didn't do anything. God did everything in salvation. The only thing we did is receive it, right? The Bible says we receive it by believing it. All we did is believe he did everything. Think about your physical birth. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and contrasting our physical birth versus our spiritual birth of being born again. If we think about our physical birth, you played no part in it, right? When you were born, Physically, you played no part. You were a passive cog. Come on, mamas. Anybody that's a mama, you know you did all the work, right? That kid didn't do any of the work. You did all the work. You, you, you didn't do anything. And it didn't matter if you changed your mind halfway as you were coming out and said, no, I don't want to. Sorry, it's not up to you, right? Things are going to happen. See, you were a passive God, cog in that situation. You had about as much to do with that as this Play-Doh. How many of you remember the, come on, the, the, the lever where you, you push the Play-Doh through the thing and it came out in all these different shapes. When you were being born, you had about as much to do with it as that Play-Doh being levered through that thing. Um, try to get that image out of your head later on. We'll be halfway through the message and some of you are still going through the Play-Doh thing. But, but 
but that is how much we had to do with our physical birth. But then once we came out, we wanted it all to be about us, right? Bake me a cake every year, you know, once we came out. But we had nothing to do with it. And it's like that in our spiritual birth. God did everything. We had nothing to do with it. So back to verse 3, it says that we were born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you know why we have a living hope? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, if somebody predicts their crucifixion, if somebody predicts, oh, too much stuff there, but that cross back there, if somebody predicts that they're going to hang on that cross, predicts that they're going to be in the tomb for three days, and predicts that they're going to rise again from the dead, and they pull it off, come on somebody, they have my attention, right? If they predict that whole thing and pull it off, I'm going to listen to everything that they say. So we can trust Jesus in everything he said because he pulled it off. But here's a basic, a basic but very profound statement that is so critical, and that is Jesus is alive. He's literally, physically alive, not just in a story, not just in a fairy tale, um, if he's not alive, then we're just playing a game here, right? We're, we're just going through the motions. If he's not alive, it's meaningless what we're doing here if Jesus is not alive. And I know, I know, we, we all say that we know that. Oh yeah, Jesus is alive. We know it. But do we live it? Do we live like Jesus is? is alive. See, our hope is in Jesus, and Jesus is alive, so we have a living hope. Look at how it says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 16. It says, if those who have died are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. So this is the Apostle Paul and he's kind of having an argument in his letter that he's writing with these people that don't believe in the resurrection. He says, if, if those that have died are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then your faith is for nothing. You are still guilty of your sins. See that living part, the, the part that God raised Jesus from the dead and he's alive? That's a very important part because he says, if that's not true, then we're all still guilty of our sins. Because if God didn't pull that part off, then he didn't pull the part off of us being freed from our sins. Verse 18, it says, and those in Christ who have already died are lost then if Jesus isn't alive. If our hope in Christ is only for this life here on earth, then people should feel more sorry for us than for anyone else. But, verse 20, Christ really has been raised from the dead. He is literally alive. He's a real person that is physically alive. And he's currently seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, physically, literally alive. And he's waiting for the time when he physically returns to us so we can physically live with him forever. Remember my spoiler alert. The spoiler alert, I've seen the end of the story. <laughs> And that's how it turns out. Jesus returns to us so we can live with him forever. And that's what differentiates us from religion. All the other religions worship a deity figure that's dead. 
We worship a deity that's alive. Jesus died, but he rose again. He's alive. So our hope is alive. So let's see what we were born again into in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. It says that we were born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See, when we were born again, when we gave our life to Jesus, we received this inheritance. All the promises, everything that God has said to us, we receive that as an inheritance. So when you are born again, you get Jesus. And Jesus includes this. That's what we get as an inheritance. And he is your living hope inheritance. And that inheritance is described by these three words. Imperishable undefiled and unfading. Now, here's the straight up truth, and you guys know that I'm always gonna bring the truth. Other than Jesus, everything in our lives is perishable. Everything, every one in your life, including that one that looks back at you when you look in the mirror, Everything, everyone in our life is perishable. Everyone, including that one that looks back at you when you look in the mirror, everyone in our life will die. And I'm not saying that to freak you out. I'm really saying it so you won't freak out when it does happen, because it will happen. So I'm saying it so when that day comes, you won't trip out and lose hope. Because we all know that's true, right? And we don't like to think about it or live like it, but we all know that it's true that everyone and everything in our life is fading. Everything except Jesus is breaking down and fading. And again, we don't want to admit it. We don't want to necessarily live like it. So think about this. Think about how much time we spend accumulating stuff. Is there anybody else that spends some time accumulating stuff? And, and we think that it's going to be different. Like, well, if I get this, that'll satisfy me, right? If I, I, if I get this, that, that'll make all the difference. That'll make everything better. And come on, we're all in a technology race, right? We all got to get the latest and the greatest of these, right? We, we have to get the iPhone 27 or whatever they're on now. You know, we, we all have to get the latest and greatest because this is the one, right? We get the new one and this this will take care of it, you know, so so we, we get the new one and we say, this time I'm going to keep it clean. I'm going to take care of it, you know, and, and, and that lasts about two weeks, right? And then in two weeks, it's all full of grease and makeup and earwax or whatever, you know, the gross stuff that gets on your phone. You, you accidentally drop it in, in the toilet and it comes out cleaner <laughs> than when it went in. You know, the cleanest it's been since it left the Apple store, you know. So we, we think, you know, oh, now that I got the latest and greatest, this is going to make a difference in my life. Uh, but, but we do that in, like, say you get a new car. Like, like your old car, you know, 
it has mold, you know, growing in it. And, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to get, but this time, this new car, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to keep it clean. I'm going to go to the car wash every month. You know, I'm going to keep it clean. Or we get a new house and we think, oh, the old house is kind of falling apart. But this new house, man, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to do all the maintenance. I'm going to do all this stuff. And, and or, or we get a new job, a new, a new career. And we think, oh, this is the one, you know, th this is going to solve everything until the company that you went to work for gets bought out or, or runs into financial difficulty. The economy changes and you get laid off. W what happens then? You know, or, or we get a new relationship. Come on, single people watching online. You, you know, this one, this new relationship, this is going to be the one. This, this is going to be the one that, that makes all the difference in my life. Or it could even be a friendship, you know, a new friend. Oh, this is going to be the one. But then when it doesn't deliver what you thought it was going to deliver, this new relationship, new friendship, new job, new house, new car, whatever it is, when it doesn't deliver what you thought it was going to deliver, what happens? You lose hope. You lose hope. Why? Because we put our hope in things that were never designed to carry that hope. And they've proven it over and over again, right? They've never come through in the past. We, we think the new phone is going to come through. We think the new car is going to come through. But they've never proven it in the past. They've never done what we thought they were going to do. They never come through. But we always think, oh, this time it'll be different. So that $80,000 sports car, it didn't solve your midlife crisis? Well, get the $100,000 one then, right? It'll, it'll solve it. it. It'll take care of your midlife crisis. The 80000 one didn't. Well, the $100,000 one will. Those Botox injections that you got, oh, if my lips could just be a little fuller, you know, if I could just get rid of some of the creases around my eyes, that will solve everything. Oh, that didn't solve it for you? Well, maybe body enhancement will. Come on, I don't want to be too crass here. So we could maybe call it aftermarket parts. Can, can we just call it that and be safe in turn? You know, just, you know, letting something out a little bit, taking something in a little bit, you know, and, and making some body hands when we think that'll solve everything if I could just change my body a little bit. And, and here's the thing, and again, I hate to be crass about it. There's other names that I could have used, right? But I was careful. I, I hate to be crass about it, but here's the thing. We are chasing things. We are putting our hope in things that will not carry you. They will not make the difference that you want them to make in your life. I mean, look at our world right now. You're unhappy, change your gender, right? You're unhappy as a little girl, become a little boy. You're unhappy as a little boy, become a little girl. You know, we have all these things that we think if we just get this, if we just do this, it will solve all our problems, but it won't. And I'm, no condemnation for anybody that has done any of those things. That's not what I'm talking about. But we just can't put our ultimate hope in those things that are perishing and that are fading. They will never live up to what we think they will do. We cannot put our hope in those things. And I'm not, let me just, you know, try to head off the path so I don't get emails. <laughs> I'm not even saying necessarily that all those things are bad. That, that's not what I'm saying. Now, changing your gender from how God created you, not a good idea, I'm saying. But, but 
I don't think that God is opposed to you having a nice house or a nice car. He's definitely not opposed to you having a great relationship. That, that's not what I'm saying. I believe that God wants us to have those things, but he doesn't want us to put our ultimate hope in those things. Can you see the difference? Does that make sense? That, that we can have those things, but we don't put our hope. See, we have to put our ultimate hope in Jesus. He's our living hope. He is the only thing that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. He will never let you down. See, when you place your ultimate hope in Christ alone, not in all these other things, it's okay to have those. But when you don't place your hope in those things, you place your ultimate hope in Christ alone, then you can go through anything. You can go through any loss, any difficulty. Look at how the Apostle Paul said it in Philippians chapter 4, starting verse 11. He said, I'm not saying this because I need anything, for I have learned how to be content in any circumstance. Man, that sounds great, right? How, Apostle Paul, could you give us a hint? How, how do you do that? How many of you have read that scripture and thought, oh, that's great, yeah, for you, Paul, but you've never been through blank, and then you fill in the blank with whatever the difficulty that you've been through. Oh, yeah, that works for you, Paul, but you've never been through blank, whatever we've been through. How many of you have done that? You don't have to raise your hand on the outside, but raise it on the inside if you've done that. Verse 12, he says, I know the experience of being in need and of having more than enough. I've learned the secret to being content in any and every circumstance, whether full or hungry, or whether having plenty or being poor. So what is that, Paul? Get, can you give us a hint? What is that? Verse 13, he tells us, for I can do everything through Christ, who is our living hope. I can do anything for Christ, through Christ, our living hope who gives me strength. See, when our hope is appropriately placed in Jesus, you can overcome any trial. But if you place your hope in something that's fading, something that's going to be out of style in a few months, if you place your hope in something like that, when that thing goes away or you realize that that thing isn't going to do what I thought it was going to do, then you're crushed. But when you place your hope in Jesus, that never changes, that is always gonna be there for you, you can overcome any trial. So just to verify that I'm preaching to the right crowd to, to go on in the message, has anybody discovered though that we can place our hope in other things? <laughs> has anybody experienced that? Has anybody done that? If you have, just do this. Okay, if you haven't, do this. Okay, I think we're all this, right? We've all discovered that we can place our hope in something other than Jesus that is fading. Now, all the stuff that we've talked about so far, that's, that's all good stuff, right? But we're about to get into the heavy stuff. <laughs> Some of you may think, well, that was pretty heavy. Now we're going to get into the real heavy stuff. Now, are you ready? Just go like this. Um, so we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Here we go. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
you rejoice in this hope even though now for a short time if necessary uh oh you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith more valuable than gold which though perishable is refined by fire may result in praise glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ see when we put our hope in Jesus the living hope we rejoice right we did that earlier in worship we rejoiced over what we have in Jesus but here's the thing the the Bible doesn't pull any punches right it doesn't try to gloss over any reality and here's the thing God's Word to us it's not gonna pull punches in this area and what it's saying in these scriptures that we just read is that gold though it's perishable it's valuable but it's made more valuable through refining by fire and then it says your faith which is more valuable than gold your faith will also be refined by fire. So here's the PKB, the Pastor Ken version of that. In this life, there's no getting around it. You are going to experience suffering. Has anybody figured out how to get around that? Has any of us figured out how to avoid suffering? See, the Bible doesn't gloss over it, doesn't skip it, so we're not going to skip it either. And I want to talk about this for the last few minutes that we have to kind of clear up some misunderstandings that some people have from some really, in my opinion, bad teaching that gives people false hope. And when they discover that that false teaching is not true, then their faith crashes because their hope and their faith has been towards something that's not true. So let's clear something up here this morning. And that is the gospel, the good news. The gospel is not that if you put your faith in Jesus, you'll get a trouble-free, suffer-free, challenge-free life. Has anybody figured that out? That the gospel is not that you put your faith in Jesus and you get, ah, oh, just an easy life. The gospel is not you put your faith in Jesus and you get no challenges for the rest of your life. Here's what the gospel is. The gospel is you put your faith in Jesus and you get Jesus. You put your faith in him and you get him. You get Jesus. And even though he never promised a trouble-free life, 
He did promise that in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of the things that you go through, you will always have one thing. You will always have Him. When you put your faith in Jesus, no matter what you go through, you will always have Jesus. And He is enough. He's enough for everything that we go through. He will always be with you to walk through it with you. To walk through the yucky stuff in life. Anybody have any yucky stuff? Yucky stuff that we've gone through in life. Here's God's promise to us. And we're going to end with this, probably. <laughs> Deuteronomy 31.6. It says, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes what? With you. In everything that we go through in life, every challenge, every suffering, God, Jesus, is with us. He goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Another way that forsake you can be translated is he will never emotionally abandon you because he is with us spiritually and emotionally. The emotional challenges that we go through, the difficulties, the times that we've laid out awake at night crying, God does not abandon you in those times. He is with you both spiritually and emotionally. Now, of course, you can choose not to acknowledge him. You can choose not to, you know, fellowship with him or acknowledge that he's with you, but he is with you. And I believe that as Christians, we have to look at trials and suffering differently. We have to look at those things different than we have. And, and often these trials or these sufferings that we go through, often they are the refining fire that reveals that we've placed our hope in something other than Jesus. When we go through these difficult situations, a lot of times that is that refining fire that points out these things in our life. And if you've ever seen the refining process of gold, my cousin, when I was younger, he, he worked at um, this place called the smelter. And the smelter is a place where they refine metals. And if you've ever seen this process, when they refine gold, they heat up the gold really hot, literally like it's bubbly. It, it's so hot. And in that process, all the impurities rise to the top. And then they let it cool down and they scrape off the impurities. And then you know what they do? They repeat it. <laughs> they, they reheat it up and more impurities rise to the top. Then they let it cool down, they scrape it off. Then they heat it up again. More impurities come to the top, they scrape it off. And they repeat this process. And every time the gold gets purer and purer and purer, and I think suffering or the, the, the things that we go through in life, the difficulties, they're really to heat up our life so that the impurities, the, the, the things that we recognize that we put our hope in something that didn't deserve that hope, those things will rise to the surface so we can scrape off those things out of our life so we can recognize that shouldn't be in my life and it gives us an opportunity to scrape that thing off. The, the thing that we put our hope in that we shouldn't. And, and none of us probably thought that we had put our hope in other things until we lost those other things. 
Come on, has anybody ever experienced that? Where you didn't think that you put your hope in your career until you lost your career? You, you didn't realize you put your hope in a relationship or your family until you lost that relationship or that family. We don't think of ourselves as putting hope in those things until we lose those things. I know I didn't. And I was going to share this story, but it, it has a really sad part to it. It has a good ending, but the sad part, I'm going to wait until next week because I don't want to leave you hanging with a sad story. <laughs> so next week, we'll, we'll continue in this. And I think continue in really understanding what the purpose of suffering is. I'm not saying that God causes suffering. I don't believe he, he does. I believe he uses the suffering that we go through just because we're in a sinful world, right? And we go through stuff and God uses that to clean out impurities out of our life. Just like the refinement of gold. But our faith in Jesus is more valuable than gold. And he uses the sufferings in our lives to refine us. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful, God, that our sufferings, our challenges, they're, they're not just that. They're, you don't just leave them as a negative, God, but you use them as a positive to clean up our lives, to help us scrape the impurities out of our lives. God, I thank you for each and every person here today. God, that they are starting to get a paradigm shift of what suffering is as a Christian. God, we thank you for this. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you got something out of that today. After the service, we'll have a time of fellowship because um, as we know, Friends do not let friends drink coffee alone. So we'll be all back there fellowship, and I would love to, to talk with you more. Um, so I will be back there too. But God bless you. Thank you for coming this morning. And we'll see you next week for continuing our series, I believe, and stuffing bunny boxes. So join us next week. God bless you. Have a great day.